Welcome uh, to our panel, A Story of Pain. Um, I think this is going to be very interesting because I think um, we are all familiar with, um, as women, of, with pain. Um, but before we start, I would like us to pay our tribute to um, the former president of Zimbabwe, um, Comrade Araji Mugabe, who passed away. Um, he was one of the um, Pan-African fathers who fought for uh, African independence and the Zimbabwe independence in particular. Um, so I would like us to pay some uh, tribute to him um, for the work he did in, in, um, in the decolonization of our continent. Um, okay, so I'll call upon um, Natalie Flores Ganido. Um, the title is Experiences of Precarity and Practices of Resistance of Young Feminists from South Africa. Um, I'll just ask you to uh, say a little bit about yourselves because we don't have any background about you. So just a little one sentence about yourselves. Okay, okay good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalia Flores Garrido. I'm from Mexico, but I'm doing my PhD in sociology at the Nelson Mandela University. So this is uh, what I'm trying to do in my research is like kind of a south-to-south di -south dialogue between Mexico and South African feminists. So, but, but now I'm just going to present, I'm just going to focus on South Africa, right? Okay, well, is this not, I mean, can I sit there? <laughs> okay, okay, well, anyway. <laughs> Well, the, the title of this session is Experiences of Pain, and in this regard, I would like to start my presentation talking instead of happiness. What is happiness, and what is the use of the analysis of happiness and unhappiness in feminist studies, research, and methodologies? From a sociological perspective, focus on the analysis of affects, it is not that important to understand what is an affect, in this case, happiness, but instead to understand its social role, the effects that it produces, and the way in which affects are socially constructed and serve to, re serve to reproduce or to question certain social relations and hierarchies. So following this idea, in this presentation, I want to explore four main issues that I consider are important for the feminist practice and theorization of nowadays. The first one is the construction of discourses of happiness as a mean of social control through the orientations of desires and fantasies. The second one is how remunerated work or, ha or having a job has become a happy object linked to specific representations of femininity and empowerment. The third one is the stories of three South African feminists and the relationship with their jobs. And finally, I will offer some preliminary thoughts about the relevance of these feminist practices of this dialogue and conversation about economy to the feminist practices in the global south. So the first one is happiness as a device or dispositive of social discipline. According to Sarah Ahmed, nowadays there are few discourses more restrictive and socially controlling than the one that suggests that every person must be happy and that happiness is the ultimate goal of living and of every individual choice that we make. The problem is not so much that we all as human beings want to be happy, but the fact that happiness with capital letter has become more a set of rules to follow and less a process of introspection and collective responsibility. Being happy, pursue happiness, is understood in our society as a personal responsibility associated with some life choices and not others. In her book, The Promise of Happiness, Ahmed explains that happiness is associated with some life choices and not others. Happiness is imagined as being what follows being a certain kind of being. In other words, there are a lot of discourses that dictate which are the appropriate ways of being happy, which are the correct ways of expressing that happiness, and which particular narrative of happiness is available for certain social subjects, with relations of power, hierarchy, and oppression being an important part of this. Another important aspect of Ahmed's analysis is what she calls happy objects, which can be objects, relationships, or positions socially prescribed as means to get closer to happiness, or as sources that promise happiness to social subjects. These happy objects are historical, and some examples could be marriage, motherhood, wealth, consumption, heterosexuality, among others. This is particularly important to my presentation because, as we will see, 
Feminism has been centered not so much in the happiness of women, but on the contrary, on the construction of the archives of unhappiness as a way to denounce the relationship between social promises of happiness and gender oppression. And in doing this, feminism has been able to open up new social imaginations. For example, feminism has been important in making visible the relationship between gender hierarchies and domestic and care work, right? Motherhood has been historically constructed as a happy object for women, prescribing a socially accepted path towards happiness. Having a family, being a loving mother, dedicate one's life to take care of others, what woman wouldn't be happy having all of that? And as we know, it was feminist theories and analysis which first explored the hidden unhappiness of motherhood as this works as a social mechanism of exploitation, unpaid work, and oppression. So I want to move now to briefly analyze how remunerated work or having a job has become a happy object for women since the last decades of the 20th century in a context of neoliberalism that, on the one hand, celebrates the economic empowerment of women, and on the other, dismantles workers' rights and precarized ways of working and living. So work as a happy object or the celebration of the can-do girl. So two major changes happened during the second half of the last century, and although they seem, although they seem to be, belong to different spheres, they are deeply intertwined and have contributed to new social prescriptions about happiness and femininity. The first of these changes is the growing social acceptance of feminism as a valid issue and the popularization of feminist ideas in spaces like media, the government, international activism, etc. For authors like Angela McRobbie, it is possible now to talk about a post-feminist common sense in the way that for a vast num number of women, especially young women, it is not necessary to identify themselves as feminists to agree with certain issues that were previously a feminist demand. For example, the idea that men and women should be equal in law or perceive the same salary for the same job, or that women can and should be in the highest positions of hierarchies in business, sports, government, etc. Some authors like Nancy Fraser and Mark Robbie assert that with the most widespread ideas about feminism were championed by the second wave of feminism, originated mostly in the global north, particularly in the United States, and became hegemonic in a world increasingly globalized. The influence of this kind of feminism was asserted through theoretical work, which is taught now in most of the countries as gender studies, and also through some concepts like gender mainstreaming and the work of international NGOs devoted to promote women's empowerment in society. This is relevant to my analysis because in this particular understanding of feminism that then became hegemonic, work plays a very important role as a means of empowerment and liberation for women. Although not all the feminists from the second wave understood work in the same sense, some of them were Marxists and socialists, for example, the strand of feminism that was more successful and became hegemonic was the one that asserted that remunerated work was a source of empowerment and promoted in this way the incorporation of women to the labor force. Although this might sound an important demand, like an important demand, the problem with this is that it uncritically accepted the rules of the market, asserting that the problem was that women do not participate enough in the labor market without questioning the oppression that is created and reproduced through the market. In this way, this is linked to the second major change that happened at the same time, that feminism gained recognition and became more popularized in social discourses. This second change was the strengthening of neoliberalism as an economic reality and also as a discourse of social control. Neoliberalism is marked by the continued loss of workers' rights and the weakening of any social movement and discourse centered around the unbalance of power between workers and capitalists that has become more and more widened. But the question is, how did this happen? How was it possible to dismantle workers' rights and also to prevent social revolutions around this issue? I mean, on the one hand, they are taking everything away from you, but how? How was it possible? The topic is very complex. There is not a single answer. But one of the things that allowed this reality was the transformations and discourses and meaning around job that created job as a happy object, meaning a source of happiness and a discourse that shapes fantasies and desires. This is also connected to social ideas of gender identities and specific normative ideas about being a happy woman. By transforming job into an object of happiness, desires, a source of self-actualization, 
and a proof of gender empowerment and liberation, having a job became more an idealized and romantic idea than an activity that should be protected and attached to certain rights like enough income, social security, housing, access to health, etc. The labor market of nowadays is very precarious, and at the same time, working and having a job has become a symbol of empowerment and happiness. In a capitalist system that apparently celebrates women as economic subjects, we are all the time exposed to social discourses that promote that women, and young women in particular, should have a job that is glamorous, fulfilling, that makes them happy by giving them the opportunity to do something that they feel passionate about. Of course, there is nothing wrong with wanting to have that kind of job. The problem is that these discourses take place at the same time that the labor market continues being precarized. And in fact, these discourses are highly functional to this precarious reality because they change the focus of the struggle for workers' rights and of the conditions of work to the romanticization of work and the idea that it is an individual and personal responsibility to find a job that makes your dream come true. As I said before, feminism is very important in challenging the social ideas of what is happiness and how these discourses are linked to oppression and injustice. So now, exploring the idea of the archives of unhappiness, I want to present three testimonies of young South African women, all of them feminists, that were chasing the fantasies of the perfect job and found instead a path full of obstacles, frustration, and unhappiness. So the story of the participant one. Participant one is a colored woman from Port Elizabeth, 36 years old and currently unemployed. She has a bachelor's in biology and an honors, honors and master's degree in gender studies. When participant one was young, she decided to work as an English teacher abroad. At the beginning, she made this decision because, as she explained, she had never been outside of South Africa. And being an English teacher, working an, in different countries sounded very exciting. exciting. Who wouldn't want to be traveling and making money at the same time? This was okay for the first years, although she quickly discovered that the conditions of her work were not the best. The money was good, but she needed to work a lot. With time, she noticed that the most prestigious schools were more prone to hire white people to do the job, and so she needed to move to other countries where life was more difficult in general. She had some terrible experiences living in Saudi Arabia and in Qatar. In these countries, the schools that hired her were very controlling, they even took away her passport. The amount of work was just too much and the contracts were for one year only. In 2017, she came back to South Africa to do her master's in gender studies and tried at the same time to find a job and just stay here. This was not possible, as she explained, it was difficult to come back after so many years working abroad and she wasn't able to find any working opportunity here. She started spending all her savings and at some point she was not even able to pay her accommodation and food, so she had to rely on the support of her sisters, her partner, and her best friend. For this reason, she decided to go again to work abroad, even though this time without the excitement of the first time. As she told me, I'm actually trying to work towards the more sort of positive future. Obviously, I don't want to be in this kind of precarious position forever, but it's going very slowly. It's really difficult because I don't necessarily liked or enjoyed the jobs that I have had or the jobs that I'm doing now, but there is not something that you can even think about, like I don't like this job or I don't enjoy this, because then what? You have responsibilities and other things to think about that take priority of what you like or what you don't like doing in the moment. You know what I mean. The story of participant two. Participant two is a white South African, 32, and currently unemployed as well. She recognizes that she comes from a very privileged background in South Africa, which allowed her to go to university, study literature, then move to Joburg to do an honors in journalism. She has always loved writing and reading, and she wanted to have a job close to her interest as a writer. She started working as a junior journalist in some Afrikaans media in Johannesburg, but then she had some problems with her boss and decided to quit. At the beginning, she was looking for other jobs, but couldn't find anything. And so she started working as a freelance, doing all kinds of jobs related to writing. She wrote pieces for some magazines, made content for digital media, covered some stories of reality shows in South Africa, etc. The income that she received was not stable, so she had to rely on her parents' help to cover some of her basic needs. For example, access to health. 
that for her it's very important because she has epilepsy and needs to go to the doctor very often. The pressure of being all the time looking for new projects and accepting everything from media content to transcriptions, proofreading, and any other task was just so much. And in 2018, participant two had a very serious breakdown. She was exhausted and was not able to work anymore. For some months, she couldn't read or write. She started having panic attacks and anxiety, and so she needed to make a pause because she was not in conditions to continue working. Fortunately, she had the support of her parents, and this allowed her to take some months without working and just recover. When I last saw her this year, like two months ago, she was looking for a job but without the fantasies of doing something related to writing. She explained to me, Listen, after what happened to me last year, I really now know that these ideas of do what you love and you won't have to work a day in your life are just nonsense. I love writing so much, but it hurt me very badly to do all those things that were writing but not writing what I want and not even have enough money to cover my immediate needs. Now I just want a job that pays enough and gives me enough free time to use that time in writing. Now for me, a job is a job and my passion is my passion, and they don't have to go together. The story of Participant 3. This is the last one. Huh? Participant 3 is a black South African, 34, divorced, and has an eight-year-old son. She studied a degree in law, but due to financial constraints, was not able to finish it, and is currently trying to obtain a bachelor's degree in business administration. For over 12 years, Participant 3 worked in commercial spaces providing services, Firstly, in a mobile company dealing with customer service and afterwards in a human resources company. These jobs were stable, although low remunerated, and they included medical insurance and other kinds of workers' rights, like holidays, one day free per week, and other things, right? Participant 3 had also been an activist in black feminism and black consciousness spaces. Two years ago, she decided to quit her job, move from Quesaden to Johannesburg, and start a small technology business. She did like developed an application which is a social media very similar to Facebook but it's for black people only. At the moment of the interview, participant three was happy, optimistic and excited about the idea of being a black woman entrepreneur. As she explained, my business does make a difference. I have been able to bring my activism and what I feel passionate about into something that I do on a daily basis. So few people get to do that and I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that I don't see why I will go back to working for someone else and make their dreams come true when I can do that for myself. The excitement to be living in Joburg, being a businesswoman, and working in a project that somehow puts together her political beliefs and her earning a living were combined nevertheless with precarious conditions in her day-to-day -day life. At that moment, Participant 3 didn't have enough money to rent an apartment, so she was living in a friend's house using the couch. Her son was staying with her sister in case then, and she complained about not seeing him as often as she would like to. She also didn't have a car, and public transport was sometimes an obstacle to arrive to certain meetings or social events. As she also explained, social media has to be social, and this implies a very high level of investment in terms of attending social events so that she could have the opportunity to talk about her business and gain new clients. Participant 3 was also worried about her health, as she mentioned, I'm panicked right now because I have asthma. Uh, like if I need to go to the hospital in the night, it's going to be a public hospital. And I'm sure you have been in South Africa long enough to know that our public health care is rubbish. So I don't look forward to that. And hopefully, if that happens and when that happens, the business is going to be already in a position to be able to put me on a medical aid and those sort of stuff. But I still don't know, so really I'm taking it one day at a time. So that's now not my conclusions, but some points of dialogue, because I still don't have any conclusions of the stories that I have been listening while doing this research. I have interviewed like 20 women, 10 from Mexico and 10 from South Africa, about their relationship with their jobs. All of them went to university, some of them have master's degree, even doctoral, doctoral studies, and all of them are in these kinds of jobs, like very unstable. So some points for the discussion. First, these very complex ideas and attachments that we have towards our work. We are daughters, daughters of our generation, a generation that was privileged enough to have access to university and to certain ideas regarding gender. 
In my case, for example, I was never told that I should marry and have kids, but I was constantly told that I should study, get a degree, and find a job in which I could be happy. My story is the story of all of my participants as well. I grew up wanting to have a job that will help me to make a difference in the world, and that will also be interesting, important, etc., etc. When I finished my master's, of course I didn't find that kind of job. And this, in, as in the case of some of my, participant, my participants, was very painful because at some point I felt that it was my fault, that I somehow failed it. In this regard, it is important to me to explore the archives of the unhappiness of women. It is not my intention to portray my participants as victims or women without agency, but it is definitely my intention to explore their pain, frustration, and anxiety towards work. I think this is important because this will allow us to question, on the one hand, all the fantasies that we have regarding having a job, and on the other hand, how this can come true in a labor market that is precarious, neoliberal, in which workers don't have a say in the conditions of their work and usually don't have any rights apart from the salary. I think this is also important in feminist conversations because it shows the limits of the strand of feminism that promotes the participation of women in the labor market as if this was a way of automatic empowerment. How are we gonna be free and empowered and autonomous when we don't have any rights as workers, when we have to put up with the adverse conditions of the labor market, a labor market in which we, as young women, are disposable, and in which our fantasies and desires are just used as a way to disguise the exploitation of our bodies and brains. For this reason, I think it is very important that we explore our frustrations and anxieties, and we question the idea of a feminism that can be fulfilled in a capitalist system. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, women cannot be free inside capitalism. We need a feminism that is not only anti-neoliberal, but also anti-capitalist. Oh, okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Matabo Mato. Um, I am currently, so this paper is basically an ongoing self-project um, that I've been kind of working on since I started going into therapy. So it's just kind of me theor theorizing me, as narcissistic as that sounds. <laughs> um, great, so I'll begin. Great. Um, so I construct the notion of dead pain from Toni Morrison's Beloved. Anything dead coming back to life hurts. Pain, like us, lives and dies. It is understood as a sensation, an emotional response, as it is usually physical and linked to physical damage done to one's body. I'd like to extend this understanding of pain and suggest that pain, if not felt or engaged with, becomes dead pain. Dead pain is long term. Your behaviors, thoughts, attitudes and actions are all affected by traumatic events. Therefore, dead pain is influenced, oh sorry, yes. Dead pain um, is, can be accumulated over one's lifetime. Within my own personal journey through therapy, I understood my, and understanding my own addiction, I had to understand my position within the family. I functioned as the identified patient. Traditionally, the identified patient acts as a traumatic storage unit within the family unit. Gregory Bateson describes the identified in patient as an individual within the family who is largely and unconsciously assigned this role. Effectively, the identified patient acts as the emotional scapegoat for the family. A similar concept arises in Murray Bowen's family systems theory. Within the family, there's always an individual who embodies trauma. We understand trauma as a personal experience. Trauma, the word originates from the Greek word wound. Trauma is a wound which can affect your neural pathways as a result of your environment, your life experiences, and if you are the identified patient within the family or not. 
In the family body, Mark Wallen suggests that trauma can be passed down across generations through biology. For instance, an unfertilized egg within the female body is the earliest biological form of an individual. The earliest traces of us can all be traced back to the same environment, biological environment. One's inception can, sorry, inception can also be traced back via their paternal line. As the constant reproduction of the sperm cells is susceptible to traumatic imprints within the male body. If all trauma from one's maternal and paternal lines are collected, but this trauma is not dealt with, healed from, it becomes dead pain. It is buried within our mind, but it is also buried within our bodies on a cellular level. I want to stress Wallen's suggestion that emotions can be biologically communicated. Therefore, we are all biologically prepared to deal with the stresses and, and traumas which our parents and our grandparents have experienced. We are all graveyards of dead pain. If I share the same biological environment as my father and my grandmother, and I trace my my, tra my paternal trauma through my grandmother, Betty Matro, who I make use of because she gave birth to my father, the, the source of my own personal traumas, I can frame my grandmother's story in a very Toni Morrison-esque way, as she retells it. I was 15 when I saw my first period. I thought he loved me because he used to travel 50 kilometers by bicycle from his work to my home. He invited me to a wedding. It was the evening. We went for a walk. We went into the felt. He pushed me down. I didn't want it. It was sore. I didn't see my period again after that. Not until your aunt was born and I was married. The level of violence which formed the foundation of Betty's marriage remained persistent in the household that she attempted to create with her rapist. My father, Tao, retells the story of his childhood, which illustrates the varying traumatic experiences which he has undergone, therefore the dead trauma which he harbors. One of the most infamous stories that my father tells goes as follows. My father owned a little spaza shop. I was a kid, still in primary. New stock had New stock had come in, and I was keeping an eye on the shop. I thought it was a good idea to take some sweets and give them to my friends. I wasn't thinking back then. When my father found out, he stripped me naked, tied me to the bed, and whipped me with a belt. They took me to the clinic. I wasn't abused. I was beaten up because I was naughty. Pumla Golwa highlights a myth about rape, which acts as the only way I can theoretically reconcile my, my grandmother's rape. There's no proper way to respond to being raped. In 1957, a young black woman from a conservative Christian background who got pregnant was expected to marry the father of her baby, marry her rapist. Rape is usually experienced as a life-threatening and extremely violent violation to the self. It is a trauma that if not dealt with, the victim can suffer twofold. The, trauma, the victim's trauma is not necessarily limited to their own body, as mentioned, but is the original site of trauma within the family. My grandmother's psychological and physical trauma can be genetically passed down to me. Although my grandmother does not label her rape as a rape, she regards this period with a deep sense of shame and self-blame. Betty had children, my father and my aunt. Her genetic material, as well as her trauma, was passed down to her children, equipping them to biologically deal with the stresses and of, the li of, of such life-threatening experiences, such as rape. Uh, there we go. Wallen suggests that we are all born with environmental resistances. Therefore, these environmental resistances, dead pain, were passed on to her son. I want to make use of I, Ian, there we go, Ian Buchum's idea of time, what, well, the idea that he used to assess time. Time does not pass, it accumulates. So if I compare time to dead trauma, a similar observation can be made. I mean, dead pain. Ooh. <laughs> a similar observation can be made. Traumatic experiences accumulate. And if, we simply, and if we are simply an accumulation of all of our traumas and the traumas before us, there must be a means of understanding trauma. Perhaps we are all just graveyards of dead pain. So if I look at myself personally, I have inherited traumas, but, I also, but also because of my behaviors and attitudes and actions throughout my childhood have always responded to the chaotic environment that I have lived in. Um, therefore, my behavior was always modified to ensure that the needs of my parents were met before mine. Internal dialogues such as, don't say this, or don't be naughty, or else Papa will get angry, effectively shaped me. However, there is a... Ooh, <laughs> a black queen is shaking, guys. <laughs> However, there's still a link between inherited trauma and childhood trauma, which I would like to illustrate. For a child, both, 
abuse, both sexual and physical, is a traumatic experience. Therefore, living in an, env in an environment where the threat of abuse is constantly on the horizon, one's behavior will be framed with the aim of avoiding any type of abuse. Although the individual is um, equipped to deal with such traumas within the body and the mind, the imperative is ideally to just avoid the abuse. Um, the individual is able to read behavioral codes within the family unit to ensure an equilibrium within the family. Psychologists have called this relationship reciprocities. Yes. <laughs> My behaviors are not natural, but a, they are um, of a result of something, right? My traumas, and even of a positive change, such as going into therapy. Therefore, my addiction to self-harm was a behavior. It was a response to trauma, but it was also influenced by my genetic makeup. Emotional responses to trauma are not limited to my own emotions, but also impacted by the dead pain within. In not addressing two generations of pain, growing up in an environment where love was conflated with pain, as well as being the identified patient within my family unit, a 16-year-old girl had very little resources to engage with her traumas and her emotions. Enter self-harm. Um, therefore, my self-mutilation was an attempt to understand irrational emotional reactions and general anxieties which I had inherited whilst attempting to navigate my own home environment. I needed to engage with the unexplained dead pain. My neural pathways reflected, um, my neural pathways reacted to self-inflicted pain without the intent of suicide as a high. When reflecting on this period of self of intense self-mutilation, it was better that I could hurt myself than be hurt by someone that I loved like Betty or be hurt by someone who I expected to protect me like my father. I became my own abuser and I liked it. But it never occurred to me that in becoming my own abuser, I was accumulating my own dead pain. Ironically, my coping mechanism was restructuring the pre-existing graveyard of dead pain. And how the two are engaging with each other is probably the, the premise of my next paper. Um, so in conclusion, I would like to understand the complexities of pain, its entanglement with trauma from familial to personal pain, and how those types of pain engage with each other. And ideally, I'd like to make use of my findings to help other individuals, right? Because we all, as I've said, we all have these inherited dead pains. So. Let's see how this goes, everyone. And thank you so much. to work this one doesn't seem to be projecting but um, so the paper I'm presenting is a, a result of a conversation I had with my supervisor it is not entirely linked to my PhD which looks at um, the constructions of gendered identities through practices of marriage um, so in one of our meetings my supervisor asked me a question and he asked me so where do black women still marry black men considering all this violence and I was sitting there <laughs> sorry that was one of my responses actually so I asked him well do you suppose we marry black white women white men he's like Actually, I don't know if any woman should get married. And the conversation went on between us and with other people. But it has led me to here, to this questions of the relationships and the toxic toxicity of relationships, whether it be intimate relationships or relationships that society has with women. And in the presentation, I talk about women, and I sometimes talk about black women. But mostly, um, in my thinking, I'm thinking of black, black women. So, so the question that was posed to me. In other words, why do black women engage in relationships that were set against them? The institution of marriage and perhaps all heterosexual relationships are inherently asymmetrical. 
In his question, he argued that he could never be convinced that there's any value for women, especially black women, to be in a relationship with a man, especially in the context of marriage. To be honest, I've never, I've still yet to get a good answer why we do this. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to think, <laughs> as a researcher and a psychologist, I had to think about, well, where does this thing come from? And so far, here's the way I am. So stories of the magical perfect day, happily ever after, have always enticed girls and women to view marriage as an important and desirable social milestone. Growing up, I remember being asked on numerous occasions after attending wedding, and this was particularly when I was young, and if you were from a black family, you would know, they would ask you this question, did you see the bride? And of course, you're going to see the bride at the wedding, but nonetheless, before you could even ask, answer the question, it will be followed by the comment, of course, how did she look? Of course she looked beautiful, because we all know no one is more beautiful than the bride on her wedding day. At the moment of being a bride, a woman is considered to be the lucky one, the chosen one. On the day of her wedding, a woman is not only the most beautiful, but it is supposedly the happiest day of her life. The problem is, for many women, this statement could not be more true. There seems to be a disjunction between the happiest day of a woman's life and the rest of her life. The wedding day is demonstration of love, a performance of beauty, sexuality, and ideal heteronormative femininity. The bride is an, is an embodiment of the ideal femininity. While the bride represents a particular acceptable feminine subject, the wife is expected to be a performance of another type of perfect acceptable feminine subject. Sometimes the two are not the same. Unlike the wedding day, which is constructed at the most, as the most beautiful day, marriage is spoken as inherently unpleasant for women. The concept of marriage for me is one of the most ambivalent one, particularly for black couples. Marriage is constructed as both an assumed mandatory social arrangement as well as a suffering for hardship. Young couples are encouraged to do the right thing, to get married, to not live in sin, and in the same breath, they are also warned about the difficulties associated with marriage. For example, when a couple gets married, the pair, but mostly the woman, is given marital advice by her elders of a family. This is known in Sesotho as holaya. Holaya is a process by which a woman is socialized into wifehood. The advice is centered... Sorry? Oh. The advice is centered on what it means to be a good wife, often shared through idioms of proverbs such as Musadi Kitsweni Ujua Maboho, which can be translated to a woman is a monkey, you consume her hands, suggesting that a woman is only good for her labor. Another proverb I've used uh, I've heard being used is Musadi Utwaratipa Mobohaling, loosely translated a woman can hold a knife at its sharp end. Um, suggesting that a woman should be able to handle any situation that she encounters, even if it causes her pain. This idea of perseverance in marriage is further elaborated through other say sayings, such as, meaning that your mar the marriage institute is a woman's grave, meaning you shouldn't leave your marriage, but that's how it's translated. Meaning, even though, that you, even though your marriage may be difficult, it was frowned upon that you should leave this institution. The socialization from bride to wife is also evident in songs often used at weddings, such as Mako Dikirinak, Bride, It Is Time. The song speaks of a bride who is hesitant on her wedding day, and the singer encourages her to, to go because it is time. However, considering that only women are warned of the difficulties of marriage, I suppose it means that this burden is for women to bear. Given the difficulty that is spoken of during marital advice, one should ask, why then do black women encourage other black women to marry mm -hmm. if it is such a difficult journey? Given the odds stacked against black women when it comes to marriage, why do women even still bother with it? I myself am now asking this question. I am convinced that black women get married because they have been convinced by society that you cannot afford to. Marriage does not only symbolize stability and security, it also becomes a gateway to respectability. A symbol of proper socialization and raising an honor of what society has deemed a good woman. In a paper called Setswana, Proverbs Within Institutions of Lenyalo, 
Mautwakhane delineates how marriage proverbs and idioms are used to produce hegemonic femininities as well as a function as a site for performing desirable femininities. It seems for some woman, unless she becomes what I now pronounce the mistress, one that belongs to a mister, she has no reason to be happy, content, or accomplished. The term missus in a the term missus is township slang of an upper class woman or a woman who represents white femininities. I deliberate I explain this in a open ed paper that I wrote called Happily Never After. A woman who is worthy of respect, so this is the missus, if you are familiar with township slang when you see a pretty woman like, oh, give me sis, this one. <laughs> so while femininities, are, while white femininities are associated with fragility, okay. so while white femininities are associated with fragility, gentleness, beauty, poise, vulnerability, and sometimes sexuality, black femininities are associated with anger, suffering, strength, and endurance. The, ideolo the, the ideologies, oh, ideologies of femininities both problematic and perpetuated through media school marriage as well as religious and cultural institutions have essentialized black and women's experience black women and white as well as white women's experiences as black women it seems one is prepared for this hardship from a young age black girls are not only taught that you suffer for loving yourself we are most some of us are most familiar with the saying you suffer for beauty often told when they are plaiting your hair or doing other kinds of torturous things to your hair. <laughs> we are also then taught that you don't only suffer in loving yourself, but also in certain loving others. True love is sacrificial. True love hurts. The problematic old say, if he teases you, he likes you, continues into adolescent and even reinforced in toxic intimate adult relationships, where violence, physical or otherwise, is an expression of love, as commonly said, he loves you too much. It drives him crazy. Perhaps considering the myriad, myriad of violences faced by women, women, especially black women, cannot afford not to be strong. Perhaps the world is just not made for people with born with this combination of body and skin. The discourses of hardship in marriage and the expectations of women to endure hardship is consistent with the problematic discourses of strong black femininities. Marriage becomes the site where black women become real women and offers the opportunity to prove how good of a woman you can be. For some black women, and I, again, I talk about black women here because I've interacted with them up with, on this topic. Marriage is not happily ever after, but an actualization that justifies and celebrates strong black femininities. A real woman is one who has seen suffering, but a good woman is one who has seen suffering, can take suffering, and still embrace those who have violated her. That's if she lives to tell the story. Mm -hmm. While those ideologies seem to celebrate resil resilience of black women, um, they also tend to normalize and in some cases even romanticize the, disco and even romanticizes the discourses of pain and alter what it means to be a woman. The image of the battered yet still standing strong woman has become what society has come to know and celebrate about black women. This has somehow become the single most acceptable narrative of black women. In this presentation, I'm interested in asking, in what other ways have we come to celebrate this ideology of the strong black woman, the indestructible black strong woman, and how have we reproduced these ideologies? August is celebrated as National Women's Month, where we commemorate the women of 1956 who marched through union buildings protesting the apartheid pass laws. The women led by Lillian Ngoi in a chant, which means you strike a woman, you strike a rock. The term Imbogoto has, was adopted by women in the liberation movement as a way to assert their resilience in the face of structural, political, and even physical violence. The term Imbogoto is a rejection of passivity, weakness, and helplessness. In post-apartheid women, in post-apartheid, women still employ this term as a resistance of violence to women. This term has come to symbolize strength and, and celebrate black femininities. Disrupting sexist constructions today, in Bogoto, celebrations I have turned around to be celebrations of the phenomenal woman. In August 2017, I was on maternity leave and I was sitting in my family home with my grandmother and my three-month child. 
I saw a call on the ad, um, I think it was SAPC2, a call for the Phenomenal Women Awards. The call was for local women who have contributed to making the communities better. While the, com the call was noble in jest, suggesting that everyday women can make a difference. The nominees were of women who had survived traumatic experience, women who have opened their homes to orphaned children, women who have done great things, they said. And I must say, all women were worthy of recognition and all the accolades, but in that moment, I recognize that we all cannot be this phenomenal woman, at least not by these standards. My grandmother, definitely not. Looking after just me, having had only one child, she is by far not a phenomenal woman, according to these standards. Standards, st these standards call for women to do over and above just surviving this toxic woman, this toxic world. They expect women in life, such as the Ugubegazela Emendwin, Despite my long-standing discomfort with associating black women with something hard, something that is unmovable, something that does not feel pain, something that was made, it often makes me think of colonial constructions of black femininities as articulated by anti-slavery Sojourner Truth, where she says, I could work as much as, and is eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. Referring or likening black women in slavery to black men, in problematizing this fallacy of strong women, we should also be careful not to fall into the trap of essentializing the experiences of women or universalizing them and trapping them into a state of victimhood or vulnerability. But rather, I ask we should question how these discourses have contributed to problematic ways in which we interact uh, with women. Uh, with women in society and how society has come to reproduce some of these problematic discourses. Whether it's through problematic matrimonial as advice, such as Musaru Tsarati Babuhaling, or perhaps maybe in Bogot of Discord, um, or what continues for black women is to represent, or, or the in Bogot of Discord, what I see is a, is a continuation of expectation, particular black women, to represent the archetype of the strong black woman. In popular media, the portrayal, this archetype of the strong black man, woman was first introduced through the character of the Mammy. The Mammy was a highly maternal, family oriented self-sacrificing woman, portrayed by black, obese, dark complexion woman. Her role was domestic service, characterized by long hours of work, little or no financial compensation. She was appreciated for, subordina for her subordination, her nurturance, her nurturance and constant self-sacrifice as she performed her domestic duties. In contemporary me media, this character has been replaced by a character such as the Big Mama who have now taken on this role of the nurturing black woman. In thinking outside the space of marriage and what happens in the home, I think about the, acad the academy where I find myself spending most of my time. How do I reproduce this in the spaces that I am? I think about in what ways have women in my interaction and those that I look up to, do we now create them? Do we now turn them into these mammies? Well, when we think of our modern academics, our fab academics, the image of the mammy does not come to mind. And yet there are still expectations for them to play the smothering role. It is not uncommon for black female academics to report that they felt excluded, marginalized in institutions or in their departments. Perhaps it is this marginalization that propels most of them to take on a, the role of a mammy, carrying the load, nurturing young, young academics, mentoring, and also doing other roles that are often not recognized uh, or appreciated by the academy. However, over and above the academic staff, this unpaid, unrecognized work, work is still articulated as worthy by them. Last year, I was sitting in one of the talks by my all-time favorites, and she was reflecting on this um, difficulty. She said, while it is a personal commitment to mentor black female students, she also seems to attract this. And she has questioned, why do I attract such students? Students that, stu students that present with multiple challenges, and somehow I don't know how to solve them. She realized that the mentorship and support of the students requires more, more of what she has yet to clearly articulate to me. In the same discussion, we spoke about institutional cultures that does not recognize values of this kind of work. Those, uh, and those names of those who do this kind of work often fade into the backlight because they fail to sparkle according to the standards that the academy has set to measure. 
uh, how good you are, measured by what one produces, maintaining the status quo of hierarchies, measured through publications, and how famous you become. Therefore, those whose names, uh, whose work is not amongst the greats, often male, soon for, we soon forget about them because they don't sparkle. They are simply not girl black girl magic. They are not black girl excellence. They are not black girl anything. They are the mammies we look up to. Uh, in fact, many of us, despite the fact that many of us get to shine because someone took the time to shine, two minutes, okay, cool, last page, to shine some light in our paths. It is unfortunate that we often get co-opted into these kinds of institutional cultures where only some get to be black girl magic. Okay, last point. So going back to my question, why do black women marry black men? I now ask, why do black academics stay in racist institutions? Why do we play the games that we are all aware of that the rules were set precisely to keep some of us out? Perhaps like many black women, who, despite the shocking statistics of violence, particularly intimate partner violence, as well as the documented fact that marriage actually decreases the life expectancy of women. Women still enter into this relationship for various reasons, but the most cited is love. Likewise, I've heard many black scholars whom I personally interact with and say, I'm in this for the love. Like, despite the acute awareness of how the scales are tipped against them, yet they're still going to academia because of the love, love for teaching, love for students, love for the intellectual stimulation, love for the discipline, or whatever. They remain with these toxic relation, within these toxic institutions, perhaps for the children. In my journey as a young academic, I've been graced with crossing paths with really incredible female academics whom, in conversations, have articulated these difficulties and yet have also articulated the necessity for me to be here. I see our interactions as moments of Hulaya. Habang Hulaya, they tell me, yes, it is a privilege for you to be here, but it, you should not be comfortable with being the face of black excellence only because you have managed to play by the rules that were not meant for you. They tell me that the decolonial agenda has to be much as feminist as feminist agenda has to be decolonial. You cannot be happy playing by their rules. You have to be here and change the rules. They tell me that this is sacrificial work. They tell me that it should not be normalized. What should be normalized, however, is for people like me to be in these spaces. What should be normalized is that for me to love what I do and not what I do should be painful. While I recognize the value of movements such as the black girl magic, the phrase that cannot, well, we're not going to it, she well articulated. This is presentation is more of a question of springboard of sorts. So thinking about what might be what might black excellence or good womanhood or good wo woman or the rejection of these discourses that essentialize fem femininities, definitions of excellence, or otherwise, this is not a call to lower standards as some have accused me of, but perhaps an invit invitation to see the magic as the ability to set new, set new parts, redefining standards of excellence, the standards of beauty, notions of a good wife, notions of a good woman, strong woman, or whatever you want to label yourself. Or maybe the magic is choosing to reject all these labels altogether, starting from there, even though in our rejection of these labels, they cannot be the point from which we define our agency. Well, of course, one may ask how. How do we begin to do, to do this when we are embodied in this patriarchal, capitalist, heteronormative society? I do not have the answers, but I invite you to imagine with me what might we gain if we stop romanticizing pain, if we stop romanticizing black pain, black female pain particularly. Perhaps it's in the imaginary that we might think of the how we do this. Thank you. Um, so my name is Dominique McFall. Um, I haven't 
done this in a while. I actually haven't done this ever, so please be kind. Um, I haven't done the academia thing in a while. Um, in two years, I was one of the two students who were expelled from Rhodes for Life for involvement in the RE references protest. So please be kind. I'm a little bit shy and scared to be in this space, but here we go. All right. Alright, so as, my, as the title of my paper says, I'll be discussing the five initiation rites in Kay Selo Dekker's 2005 debut novel, 13 Cents. The book centers around the protagonist, Azure, who is a 12-year-old and has been living on the streets of Cape Town since he was eight years old, three years ago, after his parents were murdered. Azure has very dark skin and unusual intensely blue eyes. Azuri supports himself by working as a child sex worker along the gay section of the Seapoint beachfront. For those of you who are not originally from Cape Town, like I am, um, Seapoint is the affluent white gay cultural capital of Cape Town. Azuri tries his best to look after himself by cleaning himself often, not sniffing blue or mandrax like some of his peers do, and says that he will not join a gang because he's not a muhu, which means stupid. Azuri unfortunately angers Gerald, who is a senior member of the 28th, a prominent prison and street gang in South Africa, and he is then initiated violently into their ranks. His name, Azuri, is the only thing that he has left from his dead mother, and when the gang changes his name to Blue because of his blue eyes, he feels like he is truly alone. Azuri struggles with the violent and turbulent gang leadership and climbs up Table Mountain with nothing to his name but 13 cents in his pocket. He finds a cave at the top and enters a trance-like state where he imagines talking to a fellow child who was also abused for her body, Sadki Batman, and he dances madly around the fire he has built in this cave. The book ends in an apocalyptic scene where the elements are raging around him, Months, um, and while he imagines Cape Town and all of its monsters below being destroyed by a huge storm, while he stands safe and alone atop Table Mountain. He repeats the line, my mother is dead, my father is dead, over and over again to himself as he watches fire fall down from the sky. But it is with an air of acceptance and peace that he is now in peace now that he is alone and the monsters are gone. Dekker portrays Cape Town as a dark and sinister cityscape, which shatters the post-apartheid rainbow nation mirage that was even more prominent at the time that 13 Cents was published. Dekker's Seapoint shoreline is juxtapositioned by two different experiences of agency, or a lack thereof. The first is the white homosexual male experience of community in the gay capital of Seapoint. Um, which is contrasted by the distinctly polarizing descriptions of violence, poverty, and racism which Azure experiences. Even though it does not seem like it, Dekker's raw descriptions are not grotesque or for shock value, but rather open up a conversation about agency, freedom, and the complications of masculinity on a subject which is otherwise seen as taboo, child sex work. Dekker's text does not exploit Azure's but already commodified body, for the sake of invoking horror in his reader through the protagonist's first-person narration of what he does for his clients. Instead, Dekker uses Azuri's experiences to complicate the reader's understanding of childhood, sex work, homosexuality, masculinity, race, and class by using a character who can't be understood as anything that other than a boy in a desperate, desperate situation trying to make sense of the muddle. I also think that Dekker uses an orphan child protagonist to show that there isn't a single homogenous experience of childhood, particularly in the context of post-apartheid South Africa. In this presentation, I'll be exploring the different ways initiation is depicted through the protagonist, Azure. The first initiation rite is in the Western tradition, where childhood is believed to be a time of innocence where a significant traumatic event can bring an end to this critical period. Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem encapsulates this idea perfectly when she says, childhood is not from birth to a certain age, and at a certain age, the child puts away childish things. Childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies. Azure is therefore thrust into, into adulthood 
understood as a time of responsibility and a lack of frivolity because of the murder of his parents. He recalls, my friend Bafana can't believe that I saw my dead parents and didn't freak out. No one was going to take care of me. This shows that Azuri's childhood is over because he is left with burdens to carry, which are distinctly unchildlike by Western standards. The second initiation rite, Deka explores in 13 cents, is reminiscent of the pederastic transference of masculinity present in the culture of the ancient Greeks. Pederasty, which has the same root origin, um, Greek, well, Greek origin, as the word pedophile, uh, was the socially accepted and even encouraged romantic and sexual relationship between an Erastes, an older male, and an Eromenos, younger male, usually a teen. The older partner was the active partner in this, in this sexual interaction, while the younger boy was understood to be learning, passively, how to be a man. This heavily codified sexual interaction therefore had a didactic function in society because it was believed that the ideal masculine traits could be transferred sexually from the older man to the younger boy. Azuri's pederastic sex work experiences are equally codified. He is expected to leave his clothes at the door of his client's apartments and immediately clean himself before any sexual interactions can take place. Azuri has also had so many of these encounters that he has come to know exactly what he can expect from each client he finds on the queer part of the Seapoint beachfront. And he describes these sexual interactions in great detail with an air of indifference to show how mundane they seem to him. For example, he says that the married ones are always the horniest and the roughest. And he also says, I know how to please a man. I know, I've done this a thousand times. It is clear that Azuri has learned a lot through these experiences, but there are lessons that no child should have to learn. The third initiation rite is in the Jewish tradition and related to immediate commencement of manhood, which begins when a boy turns 13. Azuri keeps repeating a mantra to himself throughout the book. I'm almost a man. I'm nearly 13 years old. Believing his troubles will be over when he's finally 13 and a man. 13 is a significant number throughout the book. It is the number of the chapter where he begins to lose his passivity with the men exploiting his body by rebelling against the codes of behavior he's expected to follow in the sexual interactions with them. He begins to negotiate his rates. He starts asking people that he's having these sexual interactions with if they have children and sort of trying to make them uncomfortable in the space. He's no longer following the codes of what's expected of him and his body. Um, uh, it is also all that he has in the world as he ascends Table Mountain, 13 cents in his pocket. After Zuri experiences a particularly traumatic event with a gang, he tells a friend who's also just commented that his behavior is a bit different now, that he feels 13. He announces that he is now 13, even though he doesn't know his birthday. This shows that to Zuri, being 13 is a state of mind and not date dependent. The fourth initiation rite is related to gangs. Deke makes many allusions to the complicated and secret mythology surrounding the number gangs, the 26s, the 27s, and the 28s, and their initiation rites and laws. When Azure angers Gerald, a prominent member of the 28s, he's subjected to a violent initiation into the gang, which also entails being sexually assaulted. Like with the ancient Greek pederastic sexual inter, uh, initiation, this act is also heavily codified. Azuri is first badly beaten on Gerald's order and then locked up without food or water for three days. In this time, Azuri keeps repeating to himself that this punishment and rite of passage is making him stronger. However, the mantra rings untrue because of the juxtapositioning of what he says versus how he comforts himself during this time. Yes, he says he is growing stronger, um, but he's also comforting himself by, quote, singing made up songs, just nonsense sounds, which is a distinctly childlike reaction to a traumatic situation. He also tells himself, grown ups, this is how they teach me to be strong. His only experience of adults is trauma. When Azuri is let out after three days, he's made to wash himself. 
The cleansing ritual mirrors the one he's had to undergo with his affluent white male clients. Gerald's henchmen force Azuri to perform oral sex on them all and later explains that he must understand what it means to be a woman before he can, look, before he can become a man, a man who is a member of the 28s. Azuri confirms that this violation is aligned with gang initiation rights when he says to himself, they are giving you their salt, eat it, be strong. After this violation, Azuri is given a new name, Blue, by Gerald and specific instructions on what he can and can't do. As you'll recall, Azuri's name was all that he had left of his mother, so when he's stripped of this, he truly is alone, with no real identity besides that as a member of the 28th. I like to affectionately think of the fifth and final initiation rite as a sort of post-cultural rite. Azuri climbs up Table Mountain, frustrated at the city and its inhabitants. He stands at the top of the mountain and visualizes the sea rising up and flooding the whole city and sees balls of fire tumbling down from the sky. This apocalyptic vision is accompanied by Azuri's repetition of the words, my mother is dead, my father is dead. It is a poignant and spiritual moment to end the book on, and I believe that Azuri's last initiation rite isn't forced upon him by his circumstances or the groups trying to exploit his body or allegiance. He finds solace in the isolation of the mountain, which has also stood alone and surveyed the city and all of its inhabitants and all of its changing political landscapes for, from a safe distance for a thousand years. Ultimately, it is not the cultural initiations which make him stronger or a man, but his relationship to his solitude and the raging elements atop Table Mountain, which give him the strength he needs to carry on alone. Thank you. Trauma, 
there's also a passing down of toxic survival yes. mechanisms, mm. right? So the way that my grandmother survived her marriage, mm. um, which we don't we don't talk about, mm -hmm. um, in we don't talk about it outside of we don't talk about that marriage outside of love and mm. oh what there are lots of things that we could talk about outside of that, but uh, outside of the love mm -hmm. and this weird family construction that we have um, but my grandmother's survival tactics is to box everything yes. put it in the fridge and close the fridge and walk away and right? it then she passes that on to my mother she passes that on to myself while I think that my mother and myself have tried to move away from that because we saw that it's toxic mm -hmm. The problem is that then my mother created other ways of survival mm. that weren't necessarily not toxic. Yes. Right? And so my mother dies at the age of 42 mm. because she's a black woman. Mm. Like, when I think about my mother's death, it's because she's a black woman. Mm. And the kinds of things that she had to survive and the ways in which she had to survive mm. made it so that by 42, that by 42 she was like yeah or her body was like yes i'm out and so i think a lot then about the way that i survived mm. um moving to johannesburg starting my life whatever whatever and i think about how much catching up i'm doing because of black life yes mm. and that one day i'm going to turn 40 i'm going to have millions and i'm going to drop dead Mm. because the way that I survive is to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have like three jobs. Like mm. I'm doing five, ten things a day. Mm -hmm. The way, and that's because all my life I never worked. Mm -hmm. And so that's a survival mechanism that she passed on to me is that I work. Mm -hmm. What that means is that at 40, I'm going to drop dead. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about generational traumas, we must also then, for ourselves, um, think about the toxic survival mechanisms mm. that, that we've inherited, that we've embraced, mm. and that it's also all we know. Yes. Yeah. If I can just contribute, I mean, the self-harm was a result of, like, that conversation but I, how i've been thinking about it in a more theoretical way as well is that and just to mention just the idea of race is that since since the beginning of slavery there's been this accumulation of pain our entire identity our entire race has been this accumulation of pain that's being transferred and transferred and transferred and, and even if you look at the west since world war one world war two no then there's never been a real engagement with these things and you have individuals who self-harm you have individuals who do suicide you have individuals who like my father inflict pain on those who are not capable of feeling who must just deal with these things and I guess my only suggestion at this point is really find a therapist. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Honest, honest to God, there's yeah. not an intense conversation within our communities or within feminism about mental health yeah. or trained mental health professionals that can help you out of these situations. Mm -hmm. Find a therapist, find someone to help you. Take 14 drugs if you have to, like Matabo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I don't even know where to start. Thank you so much, all of the panelists. I think you guys are just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. But I think even from yesterday, I was just, and everything that's happening, you know, in our country, mm -hmm. just generally our existence as black women, I've just been feeling very tired. Mm -hmm. Just very, yeah, I mean, I have no fight in me, like in me, where in fact, in, 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 like the whole country, let's just lose it. <laughs> and I was just, and Dominic, you speak about this thing of, of youth, you know, and I, I've, I've kind of been thinking just to myself, you know, as a young black woman, and how just the thing young black women, mm. I demand, mm -hmm. like I can't, I can't actually be in my youth and, 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 and it's the moment that freely and joyfully and just mm. live, you know, this thing of, and I was actually having this conversation with a friend of mine, how like mm -hmm. so, so many of us, we, we're dying, you know, we have, we're having to 
two things that you got must plan my my friend's funeral. Yeah. You know, I must yeah. I must I must take my friend to to the police station to go and, and report a rape. I must you know, we've been thinking about all of these things that we need to do as young black women. Mm-hmm. And, and I've just kind of been burdened with this thing of just just my existence and how I cannot actually enjoy that. I mm. can't I can't breathe. I can't it's constantly survival. Yes. And and it reminds me of, of what you said you know, in terms of marriage, right? And I think also we were looking at why why black women marry black men. But I also think there's something happening in terms of marriage where and, and you spoke to it briefly how it's an access to respectability. Yes. Because people are that thing of survival. We actually as much as Yash was like because they got marriage, it's a tough there behind the oppression mm-hmm. is real. But also there's some access to social status, access mm. to certain things, mm. access to, you know, something that we get within that time. So I, I'm kind mm. of I'm really struggling in terms of our lives with constant contradictions mm. where we're constantly trying to survive and we're holding on to things that actually is just the same they are oppressing us, mm. but at the same time they give us something. Mm. So yeah, I think that's just my comment. Yeah, okay, uh, yes. yes. Uh, I have a question. Well, thank you for the These were brilliant. I think it doesn't be good. It doesn't brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is on mental health. I think that there was a point at which I started trying therapy, mm. um, and it really just amounted to me crying on someone's couch for tension. Hashtag. But I also just found that when I needed it the most, it was the one thing I was very much unwilling to do. Yeah. Because. Mm. Um, while well, I was exhausted, I, yes. just, I, I thought I would bring my friend to be like, you speak because you know most of what I'm going through. Yeah. But also just that I don't know that like therapy is the place that has mm. um, the tools to mm. break, to, not break, but help you work through what's going on. Mm. I just knew, not instinctively, but I, I had a very educated guess as to the fact that no therapist um, that I know of would have access to the tools to begin to uncover what's going on. Mm. So then I just sat until I guess I could function again. Mm. But I don't know. I, I, I'm definitely a candidate for therapy, but like I don't know that it's a space that anything genuinely productive um, can come out of it other than crying. Genuinely pay someone is a good space to cry. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that it can be useful. And I'm asking this from like being an, 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 an African who grew up in Johannesburg in a very Western, so I was raised in a very Western sense. I was raised by a, a, a mother who is very Christian and also shuns much of any of our traditional practices, but for a few. Mm-hmm. So I can't claim that like I grew up the same way some of my cousins and some friends from Cape that in the rural Eastern Cape grew up in terms of very particular practices. And although I don't have significant access to myself in that way, there's a very genuine recognition that that's just not gonna work for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. Like I definitely want to resolve certain things, but I just don't know that therapy is the therapy as it is is, is the way in which we can be accessed. My friend and I laugh about like being a job mm-hmm. and how much that is much more helpful mm-hmm. than a therapist. So I don't know. I just want to know. Okay, Rebecca. I, I, don't, I, don't know, I, don't, I think probably last, last, last comment. And I'll keep it very short mm. and brief. Thank you, colleagues, mm. uh, for fascinating presentations. I'm just going to ask a question that's basically to the room and to the panelists and whoever wishes to take up this particular challenge. But I'm curious as to how do we begin to reconceptualize these historical traumas, these violences, and these modes of negated being to begin to generate life in positive ways and, and to begin to shift the narrative. Right? So, so, so we're coming up, our research is showing us that there's crap happening, the world is bullshit, it's all coming apart. <laughs> How do we begin to generatively think against that bullshit? Mm-hmm. Thank you. There's no Okay. I, don't, I don't think we've got time to respond, mm-hmm. but I think it's a good thing for everyone to think of as we catch as we mm. <laughs> go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is the first thing that we should all no. care about. No.
I'll I'm, think about. I'm attending here. Um, those who can answer it, I think let's go and discuss it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>